Hi, and welcome to the Unreligion News and Community Spotlight. So last Thursday, we had the 2017 Game Awards, and we were so thrilled with the showing of Unreal Engine developers and developers across the board. There were a number of amazing games and uh, titles being announced and taking home some nice prizes. Uh, we want to give a huge shout out to the Ninja Theory team for Hellbra Hellblade. They took home best audio, best performance, and uh, games for impact. We're super proud of that team. We also had a number of other fantastic nominees, including Farpoint, our very own Fortnite. Uh, we were super thrilled for the PUBG guys. They took home best multiplayer. Uh, Rocket League was nominated for eSports. We have a whole recap, recap up on the blog, so if you're interested in seeing the presence of Unreal Engine at the Game Awards, I do recommend going and checking that out. Additionally, this last weekend, we had our PlayStation Experience happened in Anaheim, and there were a number of incredible games also in attendance there. You had Days Gone, had a, <laughs> an amazing booth with a giant bear. There's a lovely picture of Joe Kreiner on our blog if you want to take a look at that. Uh, Concrete Genie was in present presence. They had 10 minutes of gameplay that you could check out. Tiny Metal was in showing. A number of really fantastic games. I also recommend going and checking out that recap. This week, we also have our weekly Karma earners. Again, these folks are answering questions on Answer Hub, helping out their fellow community. And we just want to give a huge shout out to 16-Bit, Jin BE, Every Nun, BR Marco, Shadow River, the Heva, Ninjin, a North Star, Sintarius, and Curse Zero. You guys are amazing and do so much for your community. You're my faves. So our first community spotlight this week is a project called Sky Market. So this was done by a, a student. So they have a is a nine week project for their environment class, and he based it on a concept called Tent City by Kevin Jick. And I just thought he did a really, really wonderful job on this scene, especially love showcasing student artwork. Um, so huge shout out to Michael Manfredi. Great job on your project. Our second spotlight this week is The Long Way Home. It's in development by Nifty Llama Games, which is the best name for a game studio, just saying. And it's this, it's a heartfelt story about Frank, who's this old man who's suffering from amnesia. And so you you go through the game um, as Frank, and you're sort of rediscovering your identity and your past, and it's very much about the storytelling and experience of going through that. And it's a nice, real s it's a small team. I really love their art style. It's, it's very lighthearted with a very heavy character and story-based influence. So, um, if this is, you know, just early alpha footage, I can't wait to see their game once we get further along in development. But I wanted to give a huge shout out to them. You know, it's something that I want to keep tabs on and follow on, and I think you should too. One of the benefits of this art style. And our third community spotlight is a game called Smalland. It's a survival game where you're shrunk down to the size of tiny little animals. And so you kind of have to deal with the, <laughs> the effects of being this shrunk, a shrunken character, you're dealing with an ecosystem with floods and winds, and so it's a different, it's just a different take on the survival uh, genre and game. So you have to deal with all these giant animals, protect yourself from raindrops, and it's up to eight player co-op support, so you can play with your friends and just take on the world together. But I really love this wonderful, playful style, but it's going to be a little harrowing because you're dealing with the world at large as this itty bitty person. So really excited to see how it goes. They've got an Indiegogo campaign going on right now if you want to help support them. Um, I'm really looking forward to it, so great job. All right, thank you for joining us for our news and community spotlight. <laughs> Welcome back to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Amanda Bott, and today I have lovely, uh, <laughs> the lovely Alan The lovely Willard Alan Willard. Willard. Yep. The wizard Willard. Oh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, a lot of folks are really excited to have you back on, talking I'm about shaders and materials. Mm -hmm. So 
Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It, it was always nice having that la la last minute. Um, <laughs> uh, can you do a Twitch stream? Uh, sure, sure, okay. Well, and so here it I am. means you get to dive into the vast knowledge that you've stored away and share it with Sure, us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or the thing that I was able to come up with like in Let, 20 minutes right before. Right yeah, so I can do that. Sweet. So, <laughs> Would you um, like to dive in? Yeah, sure. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, when Amanda asked me if I would do the, the, the stream, uh, I looked to see kind of what I've been playing around with lately. And, and uh, for the last, really, really the last year or two, I've been doing a lot of stuff with shaders and, and how they relate to uh, blueprints and particles and things like that. So what I created kind of is just something to play with. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to do this uh, um, effect, and, and this gave me the opportunity to kind of play around with it. So those of you familiar with Lord of the Rings, um, movies and books and stuff like that, there's the Palantir, which is like this uh, uh, marble sphere, kind of onyx, uh, dark colors with flames and things like that inside that you know the Eye of Sauron opens and all that stuff. So rather than going quite that complex and giving it all that state of, of being and stuff like that, I just kind of wanted to do like an eyeball that you could um, put inside this kind of flaming sphere and, and uh, customize it a bit. So what I've got is this very kind of reflective, um, uh, glassy, wet-looking sphere with this internal effect that no matter what orientation I look at, it always tries to kind of move towards the top of the sphere. Um, and I'll break down the shader and, and some of how I did, did this. But it has um, broken out properties for um, like fading it down so you get that kind of deep Fresnel uh, appearance, changing things like the size of the iris and the pupil so you can give it that kind of looking at you from any position uh, behavior. And then there's things like the amount of distortion that gets applied to the, uh, the fire itself so it starts to warp around and get an odd um, uh, kind of chaotic behavior along with things like changing power and stuff like that. And one, one nice thing was in playing with the, the eye, I realized I wanted the pupil to distort the burning around it. So when the pupil is open, bring the iris just out there a little bit, um, it actually expands that flame pattern around it so you get some uh, consistency to the behavior that you're getting. And then, of course, I can change the amount of, of normal that gets applied both to the individual elements. So this is like the surface is glass, and it's kind of um, changing that pupil and iris, um, or completely zero it out. And no matter what the surface is doing, my eye is always very, very clean. So. I'm um, going to go ahead and jump into the shader itself and, and break it out a little bit and talk about it. So by default, you can see the until I apply a lot of those um, material settings, a lot of the, the <coughs> parameters are defined, you can kind of see where it's going, but it doesn't really look like what it's going to end up as. So I'm going to maximize this, and I've commented really quickly on how the material is laid out. So. A lot of it rel relies on methods of doing a Fresnel um, shape, whether it's doing a dot product to get the, the shape of the iris or to do the fall off on the, the color and the interior heat. Um, so I find that, that there's two different ways that I typically do this. One is by um, manually doing the dot product, which I'm doing in a couple of ways or a couple different places, and the other is to use a sphere mask. So the sphere mask, uh, and I've talked about this in other streams, essentially, given two vectors, um, it gives you a fall off based on where those vectors uh, overlap. Well, we use it a lot with just simple texture coordinates so that you can say, um, at the halfway point of the texture coordinates or the center of the texture, I want a round fall off uh, point from that center point. So. That's kind of what you're seeing here. I'm looking at the camera vector, or the, the direction that I am looking at the, the surface, and dot-prodding, uh, getting a, a sphere mask that 
relies on the halfway point right in the center of that sphere. So wherever I'm looking, and this can be bring in the normals a bit as well, um, wherever I'm looking at the sphere, essentially the sphere is looking right back. Um, and that's how I define the iris. Now, the, yeah, the iris. Now, to get the pupil, I'm basically doing the exact same math, but with a smaller radius, and then I'm subtracting that from the iris. So the combination of those two things here gives me my iris with the pupil in the center. And I've parameterized some of this stuff, as you saw, so I can control um, the final look. I find that um, in building complex materials, it's pretty rare that the material in the material editor is going to look like what it's going to be on the surface um, because a lot of the, the tuning to look right under lighting conditions and in the right place in the level and, and you know, especially when you get special effect things like irises that can open and close and things like that, you're going to want to drive a lot of that after you're done building the concrete material. And so that's what I did here. Um, for the fire itself, um, so I'm taking the camera vector and just one of the channels, it's, it's parameterized so I can play around with it. Um, and this is giving me that, um, that fire effect. Um, essentially what I'm doing is projecting the texture into uh, camera space so that it always moves up towards the top of the, the camera view. Uh, and then I add a little bit of uh, pan to that to get it to move in that vector. This may not actually look like much. Yeah, you can't really see what's going on here. Uh, but this is basically um, projecting the texture to tile this way and also move it vertically, uh, which is why there's the, the line right down the center. Uh, in parallel with that, I'm also uh, displacing it. And this is um, so that I start getting that warping flame effect. And that's partly based on the camera vector as well. Um, but it's also being modified by the... Um, the normals themselves, and this is where that pupil displacement comes in. So this sphere mass gives me a radius that's slightly larger than the regular uh, uh, pupil, but I'm using the same parameters as inputs. So as I increase or decrease the pupil size, you see there's a little bit of um, uh, an increase to that radius so that the, this pupil is always slightly bigger than the other one. I could do this as a percentage or a, as a ratio, but it was easier to just do it as a uh, flat percentage or a, a flat uh, 0.1 add. Uh, and then that gets added into the distortion mapping. And so you can start to see it here. So as the distortion happens, this is the shape that's going to um, change the UV coordinates. All of that is here. So I've got a texture object called the flame texture. Um, this is just a texture that was in the uh, engine content folder. Um, and that's being fed into a function called four-way chaos. This is something that's actually included in the engine, but um, it wasn't flagged to show up in the function library. So if you do want to find this, the easiest way is to go into your content browser, go to engine content, and type chaos. It'll show up a little quicker if you have your filter set for material functions, but this motion four-way chaos, if you drag it in, will add that function to your, uh, your shader graph. What this function does, if I preview it, and I'll get rid of the incoming coordinates, so you can see. The, what it does is it takes the texture object that has been applied and chaotically moves it four uh, diagonal directions. And uh, by chaotically, I mean that I add a random offset to each um, layer of it so that they don't, the tiling doesn't line up. If you do this without the, the chaos, what happens is when the, the loop time comes around, when all the UV coordinates happen to line back up, um, you'll actually see that happen. You'll see like the texture suddenly converge, become really strong in one way, and then and then move off. To eliminate that um, occasional kind of tiling overlap um, inside of the 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 function, it just adds some value to the texture coordinates for each layer. So feeding this in does all of that to the incoming texture coordinates. So that's where I start to get this kind of 3D space where. Um, it's projecting with some depth, 
It looks nice on a sphere. It looks like it's kind of always following me. Um, this distortion comes from the UV coordinates of the sphere not generating or not storing data in a way that um, uh, allows the camera projection to work quite correctly. It's a totally normal thing. We, we, uh, I could fix it by um, doing a LERP between two separate coordinate spaces to find the top and the bottom of the sphere, but it wasn't worth it for, for this particular thing. Um, so this fire, once, once, once I've got kind of that chaotic but always upward motion done, um, I just have some math in to let me adjust the, the contrast and brightness for that because I'm using it as a LERP between these two colors. So the, this gives me my primary and secondary colors, which you can see here, and then I have a little more shader math to um, adjust that, and then there's more. So, the, But the darkening here, um, I mentioned that there's two ways that I typically do a fall off. Um, sphere mask is one of them, and sphere mask works really well for um, kind of a procedural fall off that you can control the, the, the core of and the fall off for. This is much more of a, I have a single point in space and I want to fall off from it, but if you take the camera vector, transform it back into tangent space because it starts off in world space and then mask for just the blue channel, you get this nice Fresnel fall off without actually using the Fresnel node. It saves one instruction typically. Um, it's just one of those things that I've found uh, works better for me in the way that I work. Um, and then I have controls for um, changing the power of this. So if I increase this or decrease it, you can see my, my fall off, and this is used just to modulate the fire so it doesn't reach all the way to the edge, which gives that kind of glassy curved look. Um, this gives me the control that I need inside the shader to set this fall off. Uh, and then this just gets added on top of all of that iris and pupil behavior that I created before. Um, and one thing that I did um, was give me give myself control over the, the strength of the surface normals. If I didn't do that, it would be a really, really strong uh, normal surface. By lerping between 0, 0, 1 as a three vector, which is basically just the, the unmodified surface normal of the polygon, and the normal map that I'm using, and this happens to be something along the lines of a like a moon uh, unwrap, some kind of uh, planet texture. Uh, this one was used for skies, uh, but it worked really well for wrapping it around the default uh, sphere. Um, and so this parameter allows me to control how strong those normals will be applied to the final surface, which comes in really handy when, when you want to tune something to, to look nice instead of being excessive. Um, knowing that I'm feeding this into the normal input means that um, anywhere I want to invoke those normals on a surface, I can use the pixel normal world space node. What this does is after the normals have been calculated for the surface, it outputs that as um, the, the surface um, outside of the material editor. So once I compile it, um, we can go into the instance that I have applied And I can start oops, playing around with these uh, values. So if I wanted to increase or decrease the amount of normals that are being applied to that flame, move this here again. And let me increase my visibility of the fire. So by increasing this uh, flame normals, I'm controlling how much of that is, is being passed into the distortion. So I start to get more of um, the surface of it distorting the flames, not just the uh, displacement. Any questions so far? Uh, yeah, we've had a few. So um, they're wondering, would a shader like this be reasonably performant in a game? Um, it really depends on how you use it. There's a lot of things you can turn on here um, because the way I built the shader, I knew that I wanted to play around with what the iris could do, mm -hmm. so I actually made a masked version of it. So going to translucent on a shape like this is going to be not the cheapest thing in the world. Um, 
The actual shader itself, it's not the kind of thing you'd want to put on characters all the time, but for a um, special effect where it's the only one or two of them in the scene, it's not um, taking up full screen all the time so you don't have to worry about the pixel cost. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad. It's okay. not the, it's 185 instructions in the base pass, 202 with surface light maps and 200 68, 58 with uh, volumetric lighting, which I'm clearly not using in here. Um, there's a few things I could do to optimize it. I'm doing the same shader math two or three different times um, to do different fall-off effects. I could probably take that down to one and just do a little math to uh, push the results around so I could lock the iris and the pupil to um, some kind of uh, ratio to each other so you didn't have to expand the iris and then expand the pupil to catch up, things like that. Um, but it does mean that my ability to do things like this is maintained. Mm -hmm. So now I am actually looking right through into the sphere. If I turn off two-sided and the shader recompiles, um, once this is done, I can look right through this eye. So you could see I could end up using this as something like a... Uh, a portal that opens based on my progress through the game, or um, I could do it as, as some kind of uh, special case weapon uh, impact, something like that. So it, it allows you to, to play around with the, the utility of the shader long after you've created it. I could easily go and say, well, the ones that are um, translucent like this, or masked, I want those to be a completely different color and let's set the interior color to be a little more green. And I can do the same thing with the iris color. So now I've, I've kind of changed my, uh, my state on that one uh, sub-instance. It still inherits most of its, its behavior from the original instance because it's a child of it. But it does let me do interesting things to change the behavior. Um, so. For the performance question, it's not something that I would do on every surface, but it is definitely performant enough to use it on special events, special case things. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also wondering, uh, what if they don't want to use camera space? So you're using the mm -hmm. camera vector in there. So I'm using the, the there's a couple different things you could do other than use camera space. Um, you could use the regular Fresnel node. Uh, I use camera space and then transform it um, as I as I showed. You could change um, pretty much anywhere I, I, I use um, a specific vector. You could play around with using other vectors. You could use reflection vector. You could use um, the, the surface normals transformed into world space. There, there's a lot of things you can play with there. Um, you could also, and I've, I've got this off to the side because um, I wanted the, the full shader to be working and, and not special case something. But this would actually let you use something like the um, material parameter collections mm -hmm. to pass in a point in space you wanted this to look at. So instead of just doing my sphere mask, this looks at where the object is, where the sphere is in the world, this other tracked location, and generates a vector to that. So basically it's saying, um, given these two points in space, this is the, the direction I have to move along to, to move to, from point A to point B. I can also use that vector to generate a sphere mask and then you end up with something like this, where the vector here is basically just some arbitrary point in space that this is going to look at. So if I make a strong positive Z with a little bit along X, I'm basically saying point at this location in space. And then I could easily take that and feed it with a blueprint, say, drive this parameter wherever the player is. So now this thing always looks at the player, but it doesn't use camera space to do it. So you don't end up with the um, oddities of camera space, where um, if I move here, you can see the, the iris is still looking <laughs> basically at me, yeah. even though it should be center of the sphere kind of looking past me. Because I'm, it, I'm just using the, the point of view of the, the, the current rendered camera and the surface, it's always looking at kind of the center of my screen. It's not really looking at where my player's body is. And using the object tracking 
kind of uh, logic that I've got kind of orphaned off up here, I could um, update the parameter collection to be the player's location and maybe move vertically a bit so that you're looking roughly at the player's eyes. Or if you had some other event and you wanted the eyes to track that, you could do it that way as well. Um, so you can um, play around with this. You can feed this with a blueprint. You have a timeline that adds noise to it so the eye kind of twitches and doesn't look directly at something. Um, you could easily do something with like pupil dilation where you look to see um, you know, how close you are and as the closer you get, the bigger the pupil gets or the smaller. So you can uh, kind of play around with fun stuff like that. So there's a lot of different ways you can kind of um, push this once you've got it uh, doing something interesting. Um, I was just playing around with the uh, um, masked version and I, I noticed that if I leave two-sided on, let's see if I can turn this back on, and set the pupil normals to be one, I now have the ability to move through the surface. So it's still two-sided, but the, the mask result is succeeding on the inside of the sphere as well as the outside. So now I have this kind of portal hole through the object. I'm inside the sphere right now looking around. So you can see I could use this for any number of things. You know, I'm, I'm in spirit space and I'm, I'm looking through it or I'm teleporting through some kind of, you know, space portal, whatever. You know, there's a lot of ways you can take that. Somebody asked, what would I say is the standard polygon limit to, for average devices to perform at 60 frames per second without counting textures? Um, if you're just pushing triangles, you can push tens of millions. Um, the cost for that starts to come in. How the triangles are used, are they lit and shadowed? Uh, how complex is the material applied? Are we doing anything real-time like updating transforms? If it's skeletal, uh, uh, asset, then the the CPU burden is higher because the CPU has to uh, recalculate the new positions for every vert based on bone influences and stuff like that. So, unfortunately, it's not um, it's not a question you can answer with a, uh, a single number because you know are you talking about Xbox One, PlayStation Four, mobile devices, Nintendo Switch, PC? What brand? Uh, what level of PC, right? You have older CPUs, newer CPUs, older and newer GPUs. There's a lot of things that, that go into all of that. And we have a large amount of documentation online about how to look at performance and, and how to see where your time is going. Uh, because it does end up being a, the sum of a large number of, of things, lighting, shadowing, uh, game thread, things like AI and, and the decisions that makes, and, and so on and so forth. Any other questions? Um, we've had, they were wondering um, if you could expand the on the pixel, the normal WS node of it. Okay. The pixel normal world space is um, all of the results of what goes into the normals modifying the actual um, normal value for the surface. Uh, in the material editor, it, it, it doesn't show the exact results. Um, on the node because it kind of has to feed it through again um, for the pixel normal to actually be valid. So if I make my normals really strong here, so there, I've got a really crunchy kind of surface. Um, normally, like if I just preview this lerp node here, that's what I would expect to see. That's the current state of the normals on the surface. Um, but most of the time I'm gonna see this because the material editor doesn't know all of this is done until the, the final shader is compiled. So when I right click and preview this, I'm previewing this without any of the rest of the shader uh, being compiled. So no normals being fed in to see what this is doing. So you need to have the shader um, fully compiled to see what that result is. But essentially what it's doing is it's allowing me to bring the current normals for the surface into other positions in my shader. Uh, somebody asks Aqu AquaFX, uh, how would you combine this with a regular diffuse texture as in just have this effect on a certain part of a character? Uh, that wouldn't be too hard. Um, 
you could use material layering. You'd have to reconfigure the way this works a little bit to go into material attributes. Really, I uh, almost dropped my mouse. For most of it, it's just going into the emissive. I've got a simple black going into base color and, and setting it to be non-metallic just so that I didn't have any unusual lighting uh, conflicting with my emissive channel. Let me set my normal back to uh, what it was before. Um, but you could easily then use this as a layer, or you could just uh, lerp between textures. Um, if I were to, I think I've got textures already filtered here. Let me find a good example. There we go. So just a texture grid, black and white squares, nothing fancy. I could easily use this to lerp between uh, zero and my normal emissive. And just feed this into the emissive texture and now I'll have half and half, half um, an eye and half just a black texture. So you could easily use this to lerp uh, or even additively um, uh, modify an existing shader or something like that. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I can catch the ones that are at the bottom, but <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of them don't show up there. They're wondering if you could show the shader complexity view in the editor viewport. Yeah. Just the. So you can see where the the mask is removing the the pixels to allow um, the surface to render on the other side. It's a little more expensive. Um, it's not the world's cheapest shader, um, but it's not horrible. And we're not talking about you know, like real translucency or anything like that. Um, one of the reasons that I did it as an opaque surface and have that uh, Fresnel to uh, darken the edges was so that I could get the look of a kind of translucent glass sphere without actually having to render translucency. Um, if I modify the... Um, material instance and, and start playing with the um, the center out fall off you can see I can get a pretty glassy looking sphere by just uh, reducing the the distance that it can uh, exceed the center so it starts to look more like there's a curvature fall off to the to the effect instead of uh, just where it's rendering on the screen Is it possible to make shaders with GLSL and are the performances as good as blueprint shaders? Um, all of, if you switch to OpenGL um, b because of what the platform you're on, um, then yes, it would compile. Um, the, the shader compiler handles that for you. Um, there's a different set of trade-offs because OpenGL is a different shading language than Direct3D, so there's different... Uh, um, strengths and weaknesses in both. Um, I don't know enough about the, the heart of that to really tell you wh what's going to be better in OpenGL. Um, typically, if you, what you'll see on, on projects that, uh, like Unreal Tournament, that straddle that quite a bit is we'll have what are called feature level switches. And that looks like this. So I know it, uh, basically, if I'm running in OpenGL, it'll be ES2 or 3.1, and I can say this machine, this this shader should be compiled using this set of um, uh, nodes or this set of features based on uh, what platform, whether it's mobile, uh, PC, OpenGL, Direct3D, things like that. And then, if if you use this intelligently your shaders will just work on most of the platforms that you use them with. Got any other questions? Oh yeah, uh, the gain, someone's asking what is the gain of speed compared to matrices? Is that, um, what is the gain of speed compared to matrices? Compared to matrices? I have no idea. I don't know what I'm not even sure where to start with that. All right. Um, Were you gonna walk through some of like setting these up from scratch or? So, I'm going to. It's not going to get to this point by, by the time I'm done. But um, if I was going to recreate it, so just starting off, um, what I did was I built the eye, the pupil in iris first. So I know I'm going to use a sphere mask, and then um, 
I'm going to use the surface normal. This, this this is an inevitable thing. It's like there's three different ways of uh, doing something. How do you decide which way? Is it just dependent on what your goal is? <laughs> How do you decide? You start. <laughs> really, it's 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 like a lot of other things where there's a lot of complexity to the system. Right. Um, I could come at it in a number of different ways. Just picking one and going with it seems to be the best thing to do, and then later on refining if I need to. <laughs> um, for example, when I was building this shader, it started off as basically just a couple fragments here, and then over time it, it grew, and then none of this was documented, so I went through and did mm -hmm. uh, successive passes to reduce that as much as possible. Um, so, for example, like this, uh, I originally wasn't using the pixel normal for anything, so all of this slowly became uh, a little different. So, let's say we'll do um, same match between the surface normal and we'll do the camera vector. I'm transforming the surface normal into world space so that both things match, and there's the beginning of our eye. Mm -hmm. So in setting the pupil size, I'm basically saying what percentage of the sphere do I want this dot in the center to consume? Right? At one, it takes up a lot of the sphere. It doesn't take up completely because there is some fall off. If I go to box, you'll see when I'm looking almost completely at the surface, it completely fills. But since the sphere does fall off, some of this is not pointing close enough to me to get, which is totally fine. Um, so I could then say, do this as a ratio. And we'll call this iris ratio. And we'll say it's 0.9, so it's 9 tenths of the size of the pupil will be the size of, uh, sorry, the, this is the iris size, not the pupil. So we'll do the same thing. And I literally am re recreating the exact same math here. But now my pupil is always a percentage of the iris. So we will now subtract and we'll make this emissive compile it and this is where I start uh, using material instances to make sure that my assumptions about how things are going to work are correct so I can say the iris is this big and I can see my ratio is working correctly so if I wanted to actually maximize it and you know have an extremely dilated eyeball I can do that or I can set it to be a small percentage and do a very fine ring but you'll notice that because this the math results are procedural everything is extremely crisp I don't have any compression artifacts or anything like that so that's one of the reasons that I like using sphere mask to uh, build a lot of the round gradients and things like that 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 we tend to use pretty frequently it's because um, it gives me that extremely clean surface. Um, now, I don't want the iris to be a completely sharp edge like that. So I'm going to bring the hardness down to 75%. And now I start getting that fall off there. Uh, if I do the same thing inside of um, my pupil, I start to get that softer fall off ring. <clears throat> then, of course, I can change my ratio. So there. So now I've got this nice kind of um, adjustable eye line that, that I can play around with. Um, 
So this is where we start doing like the, the fire stuff. Um, find a good texture for this. We'll use something a little different. Uh, we'll use this low res blurry one. We'll call this fire texture. And there. So now, again, I, I need to find that uh, um, chaos motion. I could rebuild it, but why bother? <laughs> so here we go. And now I can connect these up and preview. So I'm not sure how well it's coming across on the screen, but there's a um, kind of a gentle flow of, of kind of smoky noise going on here. And this, again, is where I start to um, add in my shader math for allowing me to um, adjust these on the fly. Fire molt. All right, so now we have these two things that will eventually become my mask for the fire. Increase the power significantly. So now you can start to see that uh, kind of plasma-like flow. And I could keep these in lockstep and basically just uh, increase the contrast by doing this, but I prefer to have independent control. <laughs> is there's plenty of times where you want to bring the power way, way up so that you start to get just little dots and then use the multiply to uh, kind of reduce for that. So that gives you more control to do things that uh, wouldn't have been terribly easy just uh, right off the bat. So. Now that we've got this, I can just uh, use this as my lerp. Oops. Now, I, a, a lot of times I'll clamp this just because you can get some odd results out of um, lerps that are um, above or below the, the normally expected range. But for this, um, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to go too far. So there have been a few questions around the... Uh your chaos node. Mm -hmm. Would you mind expanding so, on what it does a little more? Sure. I'll open it up in a second. Um, but basically what it does is it takes four copies of the same input texture, offsets them randomly in some direction, and then pans each of them uh, in a different diagonal direction. Uh, it then reduces the contribution of each one by a quarter. So each one sums up to a possible uh, value of one. Uh, and that's where the, the divisor comes from. So opening it up, it looks like this. I've got um, my input coordinates and my input speed. Here's the texture input that's being used from this. Uh, here's the texture samplers being used from this input. So you give it a texture. It, it feeds that into these four nodes. Your coordinates get fed in. Uh, an offset gets applied to three out of the four of them because the fourth one doesn't need it. Uh, it then goes into a panner, and each of these panners goes in a different diagonal direction at the same ratio. So this is going uh, 0.1 x and y, this is going negative 0.1 x and y, negative 0.1 and positive 0.1, positive 0.1 and negative 0.1. So you basically get all four diagonal directions. Add them all together, multiply them by the divisor. So 0.25 would be um, taking what could possibly be a total value of four and reducing it to a potential uh, maximum of one, and then we output the result, and that's where you get this. So if the divisor wasn't there, it would be very, very blown out. Um, with this divisor, you end up with something that looks like it has the same value range as the original texture in RGB, but has that motion to it. So then we just put it in here, feed in the appropriate values, and then we can set up 
or fire colors. Warp between them. And then I can actually use the result of this to lerp between the fire and the iris. So right now I've got um, one for the iris. I can make this a color or a pupil. No, iris. I promise I actually do know the difference between the two things. So normally I think what, what I'm going to do is this, I'm going to use just the iris and then I'm going to subtract, this may be, there we go. So now I've got an iris that is contractible. I can expand it like that. My fire is there, but the um, probably adjust the tiling would help a lot. But I'll also make it two different colors there. So now back in the shader, if I wanted to, I could say uh, texture coordinate, multiply it by another scalar for fire tile. Pass this in to my material function. And now back in my instance, I can reduce that tile. Now I can actually see my, uh, my flame effect a little bit. <laughs> and then again, if I really wanted to, I could do that uh, camera vector transform mask and say the uh, fall off amount help if I could type even remotely correctly and punt good I was hoping that uh, I'd fail at English and typing again today <laughs> So this should give me a fall off that I can use to modulate my fire before it goes into, uh, ah, there we go, modulate my fire before it goes into the, uh, the iris calculation. Just the blue channel, not the red and green. And we'll go back to here, and we will realize we've got something wrong. Was transforming it from world from from world space to tangent space doesn't work if you're only leaving it in the other space. There we go. Okay, so now I should have a fall off that I can apply to get that um, kind of glassy sphere look. If I set my roughness to be um, the inverse of my, yeah, it should just work as the pupil. There we go. So now I should have the glassy sphere, which I can modify that, uh, that fieriness, play around with it. So again, it's not exactly the same as, as the, the other one that I built. Um, I haven't done all of the uh, complex stuff that I fed into the four-way chaos 
um, that you see in here. But this was just to reproject that fire texture into camera space instead of just leaving it wrapped around the sphere like this is doing. But you'll notice that my roughness um, dies before, or my, uh, my surface reflection dies around the iris. So you're not being distracted by that. If I wanted to, I could leave it just like this, and you'd end up with more of the uh, cow eye look <laughs> of a, uh, well, flaming cow eye. It's the only really good kind. Um, <laughs> so there we go. Look, there's my office. Actually, up there somewhere. Questions? Since uh, I have been looking at this and not that. <laughs> You're good. Um, let's see. They're wondering, is there a way to have an emissive material on a skeletal mesh, mesh cast regular shadows? An emissive material on a skull? If the, a regular emissive material, as long as it isn't set to translucent, should, shouldn't modify it. Now, uh, on skeletal meshes, it's not going to emit light uh, unless you... Um, have some kind of voxelization going, but um, static static geometry can cast emissive light if you turn it on in light mass and compile it that way. But skeletal geometry doesn't do that. Okay. But there's no reason you couldn't have this. I mean, I already have it casting a shadow. The, this would work exactly the same on a skeletal surface. This is so much easier having her <laughs> like actually like, bet feeding point. through. Uh, so if you have multiple UVs, is there a way to create a parameter to control which UV the texture maps to from an instant? Sure. So <laughs> UVs are defined, um, or which UV set you use is defined inside of the texture coordinate node. Um, there's, there's one way that I would do it. There's a couple of ways to approach this. Um, most of the time, you I would use a static switch parameter and have um, something going like this, where I tell it one of the UVs, one of the texture coordinates is 1, the other is 0, and I have a switch that says use alternate UVs. So now the state of this switch would feed out which UV channel was being used. Um, I prefer static switches because in a lot of cases, um, different UV sets don't behave at all the same when you're, if you're trying to like lurk between them or something like that. If I um, look at like UV channel 2 on this sphere, that's what it looks like. If I look at 1, this is what it looks like. Lurping between these, um, any kind of real-time uh, lerp would smear pixels and move them all over the place. It's, um, we, we, we very, very frequently have like a second UV set that's kind of planar maps so that we can pan things across the, the character or wrap them in a shield belt or something like that. Um, so we do store multiple UV sets for a lot of our characters for specific use. Um, but usually the material explicitly knows which UV set a part of it's going to use and, and we don't end up having to parameterize those too much. We, we do sometimes um, for more complex projects because you may not know um, uh, how your material may be used on something uh, in a special case. So we may end up adding switches like this so that, you know, um, Paragon's a good example. There's a ton of different characters a lot of them use the same behavior. We just turn certain things on and off to accommodate how it works on a particular character. Neat. Just sit here and dance. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's the same, how would you go about distorting the sphere mat, the sphere mass to look more oval, say for like a cat eye or something um, kind of stuff. So it depends on on. Um, where you feed it in. There's, there's a couple different things you could do. One, um, just using the sphere normals like this wouldn't work very easily because um, everything is based off of uh, the world reprojection of, of vectors on that. However, there are ways that you can adjust things. Um, 
So for example, I have a three vector coordinate here. If I feed this in, I'm adjusting the sphere mask results beforehand. I can then start modifying these and start getting some strange results. Um, again, you can see, because this is actually changing the entire basis for the, the vectors that are coming off the surface, it doesn't quite work right. It no longer tracks me correctly. It, it does strange things when I move up and down. So this is probably not the best solution if you want that kind of cat eye look. Um, for something like that, I would more likely have a clamped kind of pupil mask that I scale to and from um, its center point that I then use explicitly and maybe use the camera vector as the initial texture coordinates for placing it correctly, uh, but not try to use shader math to adjust this um, to work on the fly. Um, that being said, there's plenty of things you can do to um, add some uh, chaos and behavior. So for example, if I find that, uh, or another texture, doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, if I add this texture and use it to lerp between the, um, say the iris ratio, So I'm taking that ratio and um, making another ratio out of it, but now make a little less subtle. And look at the right thing. So now by adding that bit of lerp noise to it. I'm not changing the calculation. I'm just changing the ratio um, between the iris and the pupil based on however this texture falls, right? So the darker areas are more likely to get the original iris ratio. The brighter areas are more likely to get the um, further reduced iris ratio. So this, this is one of those things that lets you uh, add some chaos and interesting behavior um, into what would otherwise be a, a very normal uh, thing. And of course, I could do the same thing for my original sphere mask uh, and just do the exact same thing. There. So now, it's not quite the same uh, ratio, so there's a little bit of difference in how the distortion is being applied, but since I'm not doing anything unusual with the texture coordinates, the um, proportions are different, but the distortion is the same. So anywhere it starts to buckle up on the pupil, it's also doing that on the iris and so on. Any other, I guess, um, last questions? I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Let's see. So I was wondering, is there a way to encode normal maps as bump maps and then retransform them as normal maps in the shader? Um, so there's a couple of different things you can do. Uh, if you look at, oddly enough, the same chaos filter stuff, there's also a um, normal map from height map chaos, which given a texture will generate the normals from the bump of that texture, um, which is what's being done here, and then outputs it as a normal map. Um, there's, there's a couple other things where you can, uh, uh, a couple of the material functions from, uh, that are included for doing height map type stuff. I just want material functions. Yeah, so here's normal from a height map. Given the default texture, which is not very high res, and <clears throat> this works much better with um, grayscale height maps than it does with RGB, because the RGB doesn't actually encode the, the height that well. Um, 
It typically has lighting and stuff like that. But with a real bump map, you can get you can extract normal data from that and pass it along. Hopefully, that's what you're asking and and useful information. And then someone was asking. Maybe this is not so much related to shaders, but they're asking if the tessellation of material can be taken into account as collision. Um, there's no way, all of the tessellation and displacement is done on the GPU. So that's after we no, we no longer have that data on the physics side, um, or at least we're no longer updating the data on the physics side to reflect what you do on the GPU. So um, currently, to the best of my knowledge, there's no way for us to displace triangles and have a collision um, unless the, the, like certain things like um, uh, spline uh, are designed to use a vertex shader and kind of approximate collision, but um, that's because that feature has been implemented inside of that system. Um, by default, vertex shaders uh, and the GPU-based tessellation are completely render side only. All right, neat. All those things. I um, like it. Hmm? Well, I was going to say I like it. It really doesn't affect me one way or the other <laughs> whether or not there's collision on uh, vertex offset, but um, it, it is actually important for some people. But Please. for my, for demo purposes like this, it's it's not being used. Yeah. I can actually uh, make this thing movable, simulate physics, and. Oh, the sphere itself, you mean? Yeah. So there goes my my palantir thing going rolling away. <laughs> Um, there were some questions in the forums, and we're getting a, a little low on time, but uh, briefly about just bevel shaders in general or things like that. Um, can you touch As in on that? Beveling or within I was a shader? Curious about I haven't done anything like that at all, actually. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, there's over the last couple of years, there have been a lot more attention paid to how uh, surface normals are being encoded um, and stored uh, on the meshes to help like edge and face weighting for surfaces, but mm -hmm. most of that is done to the normals in the mesh in the modeling package before it gets into the engine. So the the little bit that I've done along those lines has been outside of UE4. Okay. Any other last questions? Let's see. Someone is asking, they've heard that having a texture sample with an alpha channel is equivalent to having another texture sample. When is it appropriate to have a combined texture with an alpha channel? So what we end up doing a lot is uh, packing textures. Uh, let me see if I can find a good example of that. So this is a pack texture. Um, if I look at the individual channels, they're all storing something different from each other for some reason. The alpha isn't used here. Um, there are plenty of times where we will use the alpha as well and pack four different masks into a single texture. Um, one way to see what your approximate cost is going to be for uh, a shader, like this has an alpha channel. Um, up here, it shows you um, information about the, the texture, uh, what size it is, uh, what it's currently being displayed at, what the maximum size is, and the resource size. As you change compression schemes, if I go to grayscale, it ought to be, ah, there we go. So different compression schemes, um, understand how to use the channels differently. Uh, some of them discard some channels, some of them uh, store them, but they, they don't always use them uh, because that's how the compression scheme works. Um, it's pretty easy to see if you import a texture with or without alpha, that, that's not doing anything in this case. Um, the resource size will change. Um, it's not just about what channels you have, it's also about how you compress them and how you use them. So a lot of it is um, up to the needs of the, the surface. Um, a lot of our mass textures, if it's for a single asset like this is, the chair, if you need another channel, you pack it into the alpha, and that's fine. If it's something where, um, and, and this happens a lot in, in effects, where we have uh, textures where it might be um, 
uh, fire in one channel, lightning in another, a water splash in, in the third, and then we realize we need one more, it's, it may be worth it to put um, one more channel in the, uh, uh, in the alpha. Um, it only adds, each channel has a fixed amount of data that, that is going to be stored in it. Um, adding one more channel adds that much data. It doesn't add the same amount as another RGB texture. It may change how the texture can be packed depending on texture settings, but it's not, it's not true that adding an alpha is like adding an entire another texture. It's like adding an entire another channel. Do I foresee the material editor getting spruced up with organizational options and reroute nodes, et cetera? It seems to be lagging behind blueprint improvements significantly. It does have reroute nodes. Um, there, because the, the core of the material editor is a different um, feature implementation than blueprint, um, while we, there are a lot of things that we'd like to bring from blueprint over, it's not as simple as just implementing the feature uh, that's used in the blueprint editor in the material editor because they're, they're, they're different core concepts and, and how it's displaying nodes, how it's displaying lines, things like that. Um, we do have a wish list of things that, uh, given time and priority and, and, and things like that, we'd love to add. Uh, I don't know, the tools team has a much better idea of what's uh, on their plate for that. I don't know whether or not they have it uh, on their active schedule is something they, they know when they'll be approaching. But they're, they're, we have a, a list internally of things that we'd like to be able to do, like collapse uh, groups of nodes into um, uh, uh, aggregate nodes like the Blueprint does, being able to, to define variables and then use them multiple places in the, the, the graph more easily, things like that. I think we're out of time. Yeah, we got to... Wrap it up. Thank okay. you so much for joining Absolutely us. Absolutely, my You're pleasure. You're always a wealth of information, and they really enjoy um, all the questions that you're willing to answer. Absolutely, my pleasure. Um, I'm going to be dropping a survey link into each of the chats. Always let us know how we're doing, what you'd like to see on future streams. It's really helpful to us to get your feedback there. Um, Keep submitting your NVIDIA Edge projects. We'd like to see those. We'll be doing another round uh, here at the end of the month, and it's going to be our six-month anniversary. We're really excited for that program, so keep posting those. And next week is our year in the review, so we're going to have uh, Tim Sweeney and Joe Kreiner coming on. We're going to talk about all the amazing things that we've had happen in 2017. I can't believe it's just about over. <laughs> uh, tell me like about where, it. Where did the year go? I don't know. Um, so yeah, thank you so much again, Ellen. It's always a pleasure having you. Absolutely and my pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me, Amanda. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye.